Oh, well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening. Uh, welcome to the opening keynote event for the 2017 uh, Melbourne Knowledge Week. Uh, I'm really lo looking forward to Catherine Ma's address this evening. Thank you so much, Catherine. And I'm looking forward to the discussion that we'll all be able to have with, um, with Catherine. Um, I'm Richard James. I'm the Deputy Provost of the University of Melbourne. And I'm here because our Vice-Chancellor, Professor Glyn Davis, is presently overseas and unfortunately can't be with us um, this evening. I'd like to acknowledge that we meet on the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations and I pay my respects to the traditional custodians of this land, to the elders and to their families. And I also would like to acknowledge the, the knowledge that the Wurundjeri people have passed on, uh, passed down for many, many thousands of generations. So I would like to first begin by inviting um, Auntie Georgina Nicholson uh, to the stage to offer a welcome to country. Thank you, Georgina. Thank you, Richard. Woman Jika. Welcome everyone. Hello, my name is Georgina Nicholson and I am a proud Wurundjeri woman. Wurundjeri being part of the Kulin Nation. The Kulin Nation is made up of five clans and they are Wurundjeri, Wathurung, Tanurung, Jajurung and Boonwurrung. Wurundjeri being all of Melbourne CBD and surrounding country extending north to the Great Dividing Range, east to Mount Borbor, south to Mordialic Creek, and west to the mouth of Werribee River, where it then becomes Wuthering Country. I would like to acknowledge and pay my respect to our ancestors who walked this land as free spirits, to our elders past and present, to all Aboriginal, non-Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and other elders here tonight, all cultures, welcome. I would also like to acknowledge CEO Ben Rimmer, City of Melbourne, Councillor Jackie Watts, Professor Richard James, Deputy Provost, yes, and I think that's all I've got here, but um, also, the audience, the whole lot of you, woman Jika. <laughs> Can we just say woman Jika together? Woman Jika, thank you. Woman Jika, Wurundjeri Balak, Yemen Kundi Bik. So I'd just like to tell you what I've said in our Wurundjeri language, and that is welcome to the land of the Wurundjeri people. Our mother, Martha Margaret Nicholson, was delivered by her grandmother, Granny Jemima, and that was under a pine tree on Corran Dirk, Aboriginal Mission near Hillsville. So our mother was already learning the importance of family and culture. Years later, our mother met a deadly Irish man, <laughs> yep, called Patrick. And it was on a blind date in Melbourne in the early 1930s. In 1937, Mummy and Daddy were married in a registry office back then. And they had 16 children. Ooh. <laughs> it's a wow factor, that one. 16 children, all single babies, no twins, myself being the youngest. And the oldest is my sister, Patricia Ockwell, Pat Ockwell. There's always someone in the audience that knows Pat. Pat is an amazing senior active elder. At the moment, she's resting from a very big operation, but it's hard to keep a good woman down. She's just on the go all the time. She sits in on Koori Courts at uh, County, Melbourne, Madge and Broadmeadows. Um, she has worked for Aboriginal housing. She has managed Aboriginal hostels. She has fostered children. She's done so much and she's still going, but she's got to slow down a bit. So, um, yeah, she's an amazing woman. In 2015, she was nominated by an organisation for the Victorian Aboriginal Honour Roll. 
And what an honour that was. Well, there's only one of uh, the honour rolls in, in Victoria, so uh, what an honour that was. There is a book kept at Parliament House in Melbourne on Pat's life story. If anyone would like to pop in there and have a read of my sister's life story, please do. It's very inspiring. Uh, Pat sacrificed a lot as a young girl to help Mummy with all the babies. She was like another mother. Daddy was in the Air Force, had to keep taking leave. Not a good thing back then. So we ended up getting a job in the local sawmill in Hillsville and he rode a push bike. It's, real, it's a beautiful love story, really. Um, so out of, this, out of the 16 children, there's only nine of us alive now. And sadly, both our parents have now passed away. So we must carry on that culture uh, for our future generations so they can keep going, keep handing it down, because the Aboriginal culture is the oldest living, resilient culture there is and uh, there's a lot of it. So um, I'd like to thank you for having me along tonight to do the welcome for you all um, in this beautiful space here. I hope you have a good evening. And um, uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, Thank you, Auntie Georgina Womanjika. Yeah. And 16 seems excessive to me, but nonetheless. <laughs> thank you for coming along. Yeah. And Georgina has other commitments, so we will farewell you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we always appreciate receiving the uh, Wurundjeri welcome, and it was wonderful to hear Georgina's story. Um, the University of Melbourne is very proud to be an official festival partner uh, for Melbourne Knowledge Week. Um, we're delighted to be able to host this opening event. Um, needless to say, as a public-spirited institution, we're deeply committed to the advancement of Melbourne as a city, uh, intellectually, culturally, and in many other ways, of course. Um, we see Melbourne Knowledge Week as a very important opportunity to engage with issues around creativity and innovation in the city of Melbourne. We're also proud, of course, of the long association that we've had with the City of Melbourne and have been privileged to be involved uh, with Knowledge Week since its inception, uh, I believe. Uh, tonight, uh, as you can see and as you know, it's with much delight that we welcome Catherine Ma, Executive Director of the Wikimedia Foundation, to deliver a very important keynote. Uh, the size of the audience, Catherine, um, illustrates the timeliness and the importance of what you're here to talk with us um, about. And uh, if you don't mind indulging me, I, I'm moved to reflect on an article that I read uh, in the New York Times at the weekend online uh, by Michael Kinsley. And ex excuse me, just pulling some excerpts from it. And excuse me, mentioning Donald Trump. Donald Trump tweets. Donald Trump tweets. Yes, of course. What he treats, tweets is more important than the mere fact that he tweets. But that mere fact is non-trivial. He apparently writes his tweets himself. Here is the direct connection to the people that presidents have always said they want and that presidential aides strive to prevent them getting <laughs> for fear that the boss will go off message. Thanks to at real Donald Trump, the average citizen now has a view straight into the president's id. You may not like what you see, but you can see it. So he's done one good thing for our country. Can you think of another? Um, I'd urge you to go to the New York Times and, and uh, chase up that article by Michael Kinsley. It may not be of direct relevance, Catherine, to what you have to say this evening, but maybe you can connect in some way. Um, uh, following Catherine's address, my colleague Dr Bjorn Nansen, who's a lecturer in media and communications within the university's School of Culture and Communication, will lead a conversation with Catherine. This will in include time for Q&A, so I'd invite you to, to start thinking about questions that you might want to ask of Catherine. I'd now like to invite Councillor Jackie Watts from the City of Melbourne to officially launch Melbourne Knowledge Week and to give us an overview uh, of the festival. 
Jackie is chair of the City of Melbourne's Knowledge City, uh, Knowledge City portfolio. She is well known for her impressive track record of community activism and work in social empowerment programs, as well as her experience and expertise in education, uh, where she has her doctorate. Jackie, I feel obliged to point out, is an alumni of the University of Melbourne. Welcome, Jackie. Thank you, Richard. And on behalf of Melbourne City Council, I welcome you all here tonight for the commencement of Melbourne Knowledge Week 2017. And of course, how excited we are, aren't we, to anticipate Catherine's address to us tonight. I am chair of the Knowledge City portfolio, but it is in my role as a councillor that I too welcome everybody and recognise that, that we're standing here on, on the traditional land of the Kulin Nation. Auntie Georgina has already officially welcomed you, but as chair of the Knowledge City portfolio, I would like to emphasise again the importance it is Melbourne, of Melbourne as a place where important events have taken place of a social, educational, sporting and cultural significance, and they continue to do so. I need to acknowledge on behalf of us all the, the contribution as yet untapped that is available to us from the Indigenous community. Knowledge which is vast and comprehensive, which will inform our future if we take the time to access it properly. Tonight I may also acknowledge Professor Richard James, the Wurundjeri Elder, Auntie Georgina Nicholson, the official Melbourne Knowledge Week Festival partner, the entire University of Melbourne, and my fellow councillors, City of Melbourne staff, and most importantly, the City of Melbourne officers who've worked so extraordinarily cleverly and tirelessly to create this festival that we face in the coming week. We're very fortunate to be here listening as Catherine shares with us her reflections, her experiences of the world of global knowledge and what an inspired choice this has been and I credit the City of Melbourne officers with this choice. What, a, what an important topic for us to consider as an urban centre in the global international community. The theme of this week's festival is, of course, you probably already know, it is no, now and next. And I think that aligns very well with, with what Catherine is going to share with us. Those of us, and there are many people in this room, who ponder on the veracity, the access and the future of knowledge in our society. It's becoming increasingly difficult isn't it, to navigate our way through it and make sure that the knowledge is accessible and is able to empower us all. Now, we know that Catherine's background is one of a staunch advocate for free and open societies. This is well known, and I think it's really interesting that just in our paper today, we have reference to Wikipedia, for example, being constrained in Turkey. Today, this is happening. It's today that knowledge is not something we can take for granted. It's of critical importance, isn't it, that we actually understand where knowledge fits in relation to the impact of technology, the emergence of new technologies, of digitalisation, of innovation, and how this all impacts in relation to human rights, good governance, now there's a thought, good governance, and international development. These are all key issues in the global society and they're all key issues for Melbourne. It's more than the way in which knowledge intersects with the marketplace. We hear, don't we, a lot about jobs and growth, but for me, knowledge is much more important than that. Obviously, new knowledge will underpin our prosperity, but without the knowledge the access to knowledge, we're not going to achieve what we want to. Catherine's address will remind us, I think, of 
knowledge, what knowledge can do for us in the broadest sense. It is, we must understand it to be a common good, a public good, and it belongs to us all and we must defend it. Equality requires that knowledge be free. It needs to be in the hands of the many and not the few. Ideas must be shared and developed. And as chair of Melbourne's Knowledge City portfolio, I'm also responsible, if I might digress a little bit, I'm also responsible to uh, promote the way in which Melbourne is becoming a smart city. My councillors, my council and, and my colleagues are very uh, adamant that this is one of the ways the digitalisation of our resources and our systems which will empower our citizens. Knowledge is becoming increasingly immediate, intimate, it, it, it feeds into our demo democracy, but it can't do that until we can all join in. And we have an obligation as a council to make sure that our constituents, our citizens can join in in many, many ways. Now, we talk a lot about global smart cities. The way in which that is defined is contentious and, and, and very wide, but let me just share with you the way we see it in Melbourne. Our definition of a smart city ties very much in with the topic of tonight's address. It goes beyond the use of emerging technologies to improve efficiencies. It goes to the uh, definition, if you like, put forward by the International Smart Cities Council. And this is a quote I want to share with you. A city isn't smart because it uses technology. A city is smart because it uses technology to make its citizens' lives better. And that's what we're about in Melbourne, and this is the smart city approach that we're adopting. A clear emphasis is on our people, sharing knowledge, enabling and improving their lived experience. And that will drive our economy. So tonight's opening address is clearly the first event in, in actually an unprecedented week of offerings for our city. It's an activity that the activities are about technology and smart engagement. It, it's about sharing the information. But from my perspective, it's about bringing the people along with us. Lots happening in our city. Lots happening in the new world of the knowledge economy, but we've got to make sure people come with us. And that's why the uh, address tonight is so relevant. So know now and next. Build on what we know, act upon it, and prepare for the future. This program is our most ambitious to date. We are very, very grateful for those who work with us. Tonight, of course, our major partner, which is the University of Melbourne, but I also would like to make reference to the State Library of Victoria, where our Knowledge Hub is located, and I encourage all of you to get down there and see what we're doing, and of course, Melbourne's other large university, RMIT. So I congratulate our team. I, can, I ex uh, express gratitude to those who've partnered with us there are 70 events, that's a lot of partners, and there's plenty to engage the wider population. We can't do it alone, but we're doing it the best we can in a coll co uh, collaborative and intelligent and inclusive way. Knowledge is ours to share, and I'm grateful that you're all here tonight to help us share it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jackie. Now, this is the last you're going to see of me, I promise. I'm simply going to introduce Dr Bjorn Nansen, who will host uh, the, the remainder of the evening. Um, Bjorn's research focuses on emerging and evolving forms of media use in everyday life. He is currently exploring changing home media infrastructures and environments, children's mobile media and digital play practices, and the digital mediation of death and remembrance. He is co-author of the forthcoming book, Death and Digital Media. 
Bjorn, uh, Bjorn has kindly agreed to briefly set the scene for Catherine's address and then to introduce her. Thank you. Um, thanks, Professor Richard James. Okay. Um, so it's great to be here with you all tonight, um, and particularly with Catherine, who's flown all this way, to contribute to um, debates and discussions during Melbourne Knowledge Week 2017. Um, before I bring Catherine to the stage, um, uh, I just wanted to run through a couple of things. If you wanted to contribute or follow the um, Twitter conversation, perhaps even mention some uh, at mentions of the real Donald Trump to get him involved. The hashtags are MelbConvo, C-O-N-V-O, uh, M-E-L-B, C-O-N-V-O, and M-K-W-17, not to be confused with M-K-R. Um, <coughs> So as part of um, the aim of Melbourne Knowledge Week is to bring the best thinkers in Melbourne and from around the world together to lead conversations to shape the way that our city of Melbourne evolves. And so I'm delighted to be able to participate in this to introduce both the topic uh, and the speaker tonight. Uh, Wikipedia, as I'm sure you're all familiar, is now thoroughly woven into the fabric of the internet. It's a source of knowledge and a site that many of us, I'm sure, have participated in building through its open and collaborative architecture. It is then in the short lifespans of many internet organisations, seemingly permanent and hardwired into the web, something that we take for granted. Yet it requires ongoing support and maintenance, which is where the Wikimedia Foundation and its dedicated staff come in. Catherine Ma is the Executive Director of the Wikimedia Foundation the non-profit organisation that supports Wikipedia and a range of its sister projects. She's a long-time advocate for free and open societies and has lived and worked around the world leading the introduction of technology and innovation in human rights, good governance and international development. She's worked with UNICEF, the National Democratic Institute, the World Bank and Access Now on programs supporting technologies for democratic participation, civic engagement and open government. She's a member of the World Economic Forum's Global Council on Human Rights and a fellow at the Truman National Security Project. So tonight, as we can see from behind us, she'll be talking on the topic of the democratisation of knowledge. Something, as uh, uh, Councillor Watts has already flagged, by recent events in the last 24 hours in Turkey, is something that is not easy and not certain, and certainly something not to be taken for granted. So could join me in welcoming Catherine to the stage. Good evening. Am I um, trying to turn myself on? I think I might need to turn myself on. <coughs> Good evening. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Excellent. While we get the slides up, I just want to say thank you, and I'm going to try to remember all my thank yous. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Thank you, Bjorn. And thank you, Auntie Jordina. And thank you to the University of Melbourne and to all of you here this evening for having me. I am going to talk about the democratization of knowledge. I'm also really probably going to talk about how knowledge is generosity. Well, we wait for the slides, because technology. Um, how many of you here used Wikipedia in the last week? Oh, I love that. <laughs> How many of you here edited Wikipedia in the last year? Oh my god, that's even better. That's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much. Because as Bjorn said, it's not just about sustaining Wikipedia. It is about a living body of knowledge that continues evolving and thriving. And so, oh, we're just going to go one slide. Oh, no, that's great. We, no, one slide back. <laughs> Perfect. So as I said, knowledge is generosity. And this is a really cozy keynote venue, so I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. This is great. Um, so rather than the democratization of knowledge, which I do think is part of what Wikipedia does, I want to talk about why knowledge is generosity and what that means for our future. And while we've heard allusions to the fact that the world is an interesting and challenging and difficult place right now, I'm hopefully going to leave you feeling inspired and warm and good about it. Uh-oh, we have some sound effects and stuff going on here. Cool. Yep, we're good. 
All right, so some cities have film festivals and some cities have wine festivals. And if you are like me and you're from San Francisco, you have both and sometimes at once. But I have to say that coming to a city with a knowledge festival has me so excited. A big citywide celebration of innovation and openness and creativity and thinking. And so for me, this is very much my kind of party and I couldn't be happier to be here to kick it off. Um, as the executive director of the Wikimedia Foundation, I spend most of my day thinking about how knowledge should be free and how to make what isn't free, freer. Uh, at the Wikimedia Foundation, we run the technology and the logistics behind Wikipedia and its sister knowledge projects. But in the big picture, what we really do is we work to support an audacious vision, a vision in which every single human can freely share in the sum of all knowledge. Less than two decades ago, at the beginning of this still very young century, that probably seemed like a crazy idea, idealistic to the point of absurdity. And how could anyone ever think to capture all the world's knowledge, let alone have everyone participate in it? Today, I still think it sounds like a crazy, idealistic, audacious idea, but it is a crazy, idealistic, audacious idea that excites and inspires, and it is something that has become part of the fabric of our lives, something that people use, love, and trust every single day. So how did this happen? Wikipedia is possible and it exists because of its vision, a free, open, participatory encyclopedia. But it is more than that. It is an encyclopedia that has inspired a global movement for knowledge. And as I look into the room today, and as I've seen some of you raise your hands to say, gosh, I participated in that movement for knowledge, you know that that's true. Hundreds of thousands of people from every corner of the globe have contributed working every day to make this vision a reality. They're extraordinarily diverse, geographically unbounded, united by their love and dedication, and sometimes addiction for free, and open information. And they are why I'm here. They're the reason. The organizers of this great event invited me to speak about the future of knowledge, how it's going to be more accessible and how it's going to be more inclusive. And without a doubt, if we are going to surmount the challenges that we face today, this must be true. And if we are going to make that happen, it is because of the sort of people who have built Wikipedia. They're ordinary people, people like you and people like me, I edit Wikipedia, and as I said, some of you do too. So the future of knowledge is actually in our hands, which is a pretty empowering thing. And in this age of too much fear and cynicism and doubt, that actually gives me tremendous hope. Because I believe that every community can be built around a vision. That when things are difficult and when times are tough, then rather than stand in opposition, it is really meaningful to find something to stand for to stand for something rather than against. And today, that vision, that standing for something rather than against, has really changed the way that we think about knowledge in the world. So a student in Melbourne can, at the tip of their fingers, call up knowledge so that learning isn't just in a classroom. Learning is a part of everyday life. They can understand the historical inspiration behind things that they read in Harry Potter. They can also understand what's going on in the world as we see mass migrations of people. What are the causes behind this? Learning becomes interwoven in every single part of what we do. They are hopefully empowered. They are hopefully inspired. They are certainly enriched. And because of ordinary people, people like you and me, people who edit Wikipedia, it's not just the student. Behind me is an image of this wonderful woman, Neta Hussain. She was a medical student in Kerala, India. At the time, access to, in access to the internet was expensive and limited, and she found that her textbooks were often, unfortunately, out of date. She went to Wikipedia to supplement her studies and learning. And she was so inspired by what she found there, she started translating articles from English into her native language, Malayalam. Today, Neta is a Wikipedia editor. And because of people like Neta and other doctors around the world, now you can download all of Wikipedia's 50,000 high quality medical articles onto your mobile phone and take them with you no matter where you go. This has a tremendous impact on the way that information spreads. This is because of ordinary people. Now imagine that this is everyone 
that with good sources of information and a commitment to knowledge, you can take part in building a careful, collaborative, open process for something that is a remarkable resource for the world. This makes us enriched. This makes us empowered. This makes us inspired. The Wikimedia projects have now grown 16 years into their existence into the largest collection of human knowledge, free collaborative knowledge in human history. They have more than 50 million articles across 300 languages. They are the product of three billion edits over time. Every single minute, Wikipedia is updated 350 times, which means by the time I'm off the stage, it will have been edited 7,000 times. I find those numbers staggering. More than 200,000 people contribute every single month, millions across the years. And the projects themselves receive about a billion visits from devices from every corner of the globe that go through 15 billion pages of knowledge every single month. To me, this speaks to such a huge hunger for learning that we all share, no matter who we are, no matter where we come from. And of course, Wikipedia is not the only driver of free and open and collaborative knowledge today. In fact, we are just one part of this knowledge ecosystem. We build a layer on top of a foundation of knowledge. We rely on secondary sources, open access journals. Um, we work with libraries as re librarian, libraries, excuse me, libraries as references to build out and improve the quality of our articles. This helps us keep Wikipedia growing and thriving and accurate, but it also helps us introduce people to a vast web of research and learning. From a single Wikipedia article, you can click to navigate through all of the citations to great journalism, the collections of some of the world's leading archives and institutions and universities, the latest research in open science. What we do is possible only because we hold a vision that is shared by so many others. From the researchers with the flash of genius, to the scientists who test hypotheses, to the journalists who cultivate their sources, we have a kinship with the curious. We, the curious, believe that knowledge isn't about confirming our beliefs, but about testing them. Now, technology is what has made all of this possible. As we all know, computing and telecommunications technologies have demolished many of the barriers that stood in the way of knowledge previously. And Wikipedia comes from the best part of, what, of the early internet the original version of a connected world. From free and open internet protocols to open data standards, we are from the old internet. We are from the fun internet. We are from the weird internet that you might remember. <laughs> yeah, you know. <laughs> we come from a place when the promise of the internet was a place of learning and creativity and sharing and education. And we still firmly and strongly believe in this internet. This is a vision that we aspire to and a vision that we hold. But as we've seen so vividly in the past year, we also know that technology is not a unilateral force for free and open sharing and knowledge and education and good. In fact, I'm a very big believer in the adage that technology is not good, nor is it bad, nor is it neutral. It just, in fact, is. In this age of hyperactive, profit-seeking, information sharing, it has changed our knowledge ecosystem. Sometimes in very dubious ways, I would argue, the extreme commodification of clickbait culture and the rise of this sort of human attentioning succubus, attention succubus, excuse me, this poses some challenges for our societies. It poses some challenges for our shared narratives of selves. It's safe to say that, in fact, um, we don't really know where it's all going to go. We don't know how it's going to change. I can't tell you what the world is going to look like tomorrow. I can't tell you what it's going to look like in 15 years, in twice as much time as Wikipedia has existed. But luckily, I do believe that Wikipedia offers us some pretty clear values and guidance for how we might imagine this future and points us towards perhaps a brighter world. So I've talked a little bit about the fact that Wikipedia is built by a community. And what is it that animates this wonderful community? Well, some really like to edit. They like to count their edits and watch that edit count rise. Some are grammar, uh, are sticklers for grammar. Um, 
<laughs> well, there's a lot of laughs in the audience on that. Um, that's great. If you are a stickler for grammar and that is the first thing that gets you editing Wikipedia, I strongly encourage it. <laughs> it's a wonderful contribution. Um, but the primary reason that people edit is that they believe in the Wikimedia values and vision. They, and so let's break that down, right? So the vision is that every single human should be able to freely share in the sum of all knowledge, as I mentioned earlier. And I really see that as three distinct things. Every single human, which means that every person on the planet, regardless of their geography, regardless of their language or ability, should be able to join us in this work. All knowledge means being inclusive of all forms of knowledge, not just the Western canon. But for me, the really critical word is share. Because share means participate, not just consume. It means collaborate. It means create. It means being an active, thoughtful partner in the world that we want to build. Time after time, when we poll people, this is the number one response as to why they contribute to Wikimedia. They want to contribute to the world. They want to change the world. They genuinely believe that Wikipedia is here to do that. That good information is critical to the improvement of our societies. That with access to information, citizens will be better informed. That students will more thoroughly learn their lessons. That job seekers will have the critical information that they need. That endangered cultures and languages will be able to live on and thrive. That politicians will be held accountable. We all like that and that artists will be inspired to greater works. That we together advance when we together share. And so as we like to say at the Wikimedia Foundation, it's a pretty good thing that Wikipedia works in practice because it would never work in theory, right? It's kind of crazy. How do you get all these people from all over the world to agree on anything? I mean, it's a bit of a joke, but I think that it also points to something real that theorists tend to assume that people are selfish and that Wikipedia is actually evidence otherwise. Another way to think about this is that Wikipedia runs on human generosity, that people want to share beyond themselves to build something bigger. What underlines this whole story is that more people want to do good than harm. I think that's pretty powerful. But of course, generosity is just one thing. It's just one aspect of it. In fact, it wouldn't be possible to build Wikipedia without some rules and some policies and some values. Wikipedians, if you know them, are, are sticklers for, for policies and rules. And over the, over the course of 16 years, they've built some pretty good ones. Uh, policies that arise from deep and durable values. And I want to speak a little bit about those here tonight because I think that they offer a perspective on a positive future. Neutrality, verifiability, Transparency and inclusivity. These are all part of who we are as Wikimedians. These are all part of the world that we wish to share. These values and the policies built around them make Wikipedia possible. I believe they're also part of what makes Wikipedia trusted. They define our community and they differentiate us in the global knowledge information ecosystem. They make us sustainable and they're why I believe we're going to be around for the long haul. Yeah, so, <laughs> sorry. And I believe that each of these values, in fact, are part of building an enriched and informed and empowered world, as I mentioned earlier. So what are they? Neutrality. Neutrality is about the fact that knowledge is dynamic and multifaceted and constantly evolving. It changes based on a frame of reference, a point in time, a place which we find ourselves. Neutrality is what gives us perspective on all of these different lenses through which we experience the world. It makes room for a plurality of of experiences and views so that we can get the full picture. This idea is central to Wikipedia. It's what allows all of these different people to participate and hopefully come to some form of consensus and an approximation of what might be the truth. It doesn't mean giving equal weight to conflicting viewpoints, but rather presenting all of the major points as they exist based on credible evidence and noting controversy where it exists. It allows Wikipedians to write thoughtful, articulate articles about the most delicate of subjects from religious beliefs to national borders. And when you first start editing Wikipedia, I can promise you neutrality is actually a little bit tough. It can be difficult. We all want information sources to confirm our own biases. But it turns out that working through neutrality can actually change the very way we think. In fact, a study performed earlier this year by Harvard University School of Business found that if you come into editing Wikipedia with a particularly partisan point of view, you know, you're coming in with language and strong opinions, 
Over time, if you stick around, editing Wikipedia actually changes you. You become more neutral. You become more reasoned. You become more open to dialogue. I actually don't know another place on the internet where that happens, so I think that's pretty incredible. <laughs> And there are plenty of places on the internet that feed our biases. Neutrality is about working through open discourse. It's about finding consensus amid complexity in order to have a real conversation. And I know that we all are so hungry for real conversations today. So the next, verifiability, what's that about? You know, it's a fancy word for a simple idea that is familiar to any of you who has written a school paper. You have to cite your sources. You have to show where information comes from. On Wikipedia, we don't believe that you need to take our word for it. That's what the citations are there for. If you have a question about where something came from, you can always check. It's included. You can decide for yourself. In every article, Wikipedians must point to where they found their information by citing reliable secondary sources. There is no original research on Wikipedia. It's not what we're for. But so how do we define reliable in this day and age? Your definition of reliable might be different than mine. And I feel like it's actually quite easy. How do we think about knowledge? Do we engage in critical self-reflection? Wikipedians look at this as, do you think about fact-checking? Do you issue, issue corrections when you get something wrong? Do you go through some sort of editorial process? Are you open to peer review? And this approach allows them to apply this lens of reliability to almost any source that you can imagine, whether writing about 16th century Islamic art or current events, because those are very different sources for those two very different topics, as you could well imagine. So reliability is really about the characteristic of a source, and then citing that back to be in Wikipedia. Bad information, in fact, because we were talking about fake news earlier, isn't a new problem. It has been around since at least the advent of the printing press, and rigorous sourcing has always been the solution, along with critical thinking. In fact, a fun fact about uh, rigorous sourcing, I learned in, over the course of the past year as fake news has sort of been swirling around, that academic sourcing, to the best of our knowledge, dates to the trial of Galileo. Because you can imagine as a scholar in the 1600s, as this is going on, you probably wanted to be able to point to your sources as to where your ideas came from. That makes sense to me. So neutrality and verifiability, no original research. How do we ensure that these principles are followed? Rigorous, complete, and sometimes a little bit painful transparency. That's a really big part of it. I also believe that this is what's possible to make it, this is what makes it possible to mostly trust Wikipedia. As I said, you should always check the citations and the sources, that's what they're there for. But it's the fact that we are accountable to the world through that transparency. You can review almost every single edit that has ever been made to Wikipedia all the way back to the beginning, the first step in every article, the first part of every conversation and discussion. You can see what information was added, who added it, and very often why they added it. And even if you never take advantage of this, Wikipedians know that that power is there. It holds us accountable. It's a powerful motivating responsibility, the ability to check and challenge and change. It's what we believe is core to our responsibility to the public. Transparency is a promise to each other that we will operate in good faith, that when we lay everything on the table, that's when we can begin to truly engage in our differences. We can hold each other accountable, and we can really, truly catch the problems before they start. And now I want to put in a word for inclusivity. Inclusivity is not actually a core policy of Wikipedia, nor is it a value that we officially hold. But I believe that it's there in the promise of our vision. Every single person, all the world's knowledge, for everyone to share in. I think that it is an essential value, and I think it's actually critical to the way that we will achieve that vision. And so what do I mean when I talk about inclusivity? I mean making space for the participation of all people, regardless of where they come from, what language they speak, what country, what culture, what ethnicity, what religion, what identity. To have all of the world's knowledge, we need to reflect the experiences of all of the world's people. Because Wikipedia is written by the world, it is actually a mirror to our biases. It reflects all the biases that we hold. Articles about men, Europe, and technology dominate our content. 
This is reflective not just of the interests of Wikipedia editors, which it sometimes is, but it is also the sort of information historically considered worthy of being encyclopedic. And now, today, the more that we know what's in Wikipedia, the more that we know what is missing. We are not constrained by shelf space. There is no constraint on the internet. The limitations are only in our own mind. The limitations are only in our own worldview. And why is this a problem? Because 16% of the biographies on English Wikipedia are about women. 16%. That's it. And of all the content on Wikipedia that is about a place that has a geotag associated with it, only 2.5% is about the whole continent of Africa. You can see how much we are missing from knowledge. And so we need more articles, not just about battleships and dead philosophers and Linux operating systems. <laughs> Those are great. We love those too. But about female scientists and African authors and queer artists and indigenous leaders. All of this knowledge is the world's knowledge and it belongs on Wikipedia. We need all, on, all knowledge and it's not just Wikipedia. When I say we, I mean we. <laughs> okay. So. These biases aside, I hope what you're taking from me is that I'm actually a tremendous believer in the good of humanity. I believe that see Wikipedia as a hopeful story of what people can do when they come together to foreknowledge and to create more understanding. I'm certainly not blind to the problems. The world's information ecosystem faces considerable challenges. The specters of rising sensationalism and declining empiricism are real. The fall of our common consensus isn't a social annoyance. It is actually a clear and present danger to our problem-solving capacity as humanity. And trust me, Wikipedia alone is not going to save us. We're an encyclopedia. That's what we are. We are not a platform for deciding policy, solving grand challenges like climate change, or mediating public opinion on matters of war and peace. But I do think that we can look to Wikipedia as instructive for how one can actually implement some of these values in the world and come to consensus and have conversation. For discourse and to work in an age of information free for all, we need clear ground rules. We need commitment to civil dialogue. We need commitment to neutrality, to verifiability, to inclusivity and transparency. These must be active values that we hold. We need generosity of spirit and conversation, and we need more reverence for the truth. These are values that we can put into practice every single day, as those of us here in this room, in our work, in our governments, in our news organizations, in our nonprofits, in our businesses. These are the values that we can stand for. I spoke earlier about the fact that standing for and not against is a powerful thing to do. Because Wikipedia isn't just an online encyclopedia, it is a global community that stands for something. It stands and embodies principles and practices for our time. It is about believing in something greater than ourselves and putting in the effort, edit by edit and hour by hour, to bring it to fruition anonymously, but yet for us all. I mentioned before that I believe that Wikipedia runs on human generosity. I do believe this. I believe that what underlines this whole crazy idealistic idea is this idea that more people want to do good than harm, that more people want to create than censor, that more people want to share than, than withhold. I have to believe this. I hope that you will all believe this, because if it wasn't this way, we wouldn't have a chance. And so late at night, tonight, perhaps when you go home, and you're wondering about the state of things today, how we get, got ourselves into this global situation where our countries feel as though they're turning inward or against each other, when it feels like racism and xenophobia and violence are the buzzwords of the day, I encourage you all to go to Wikipedia <laughs> and pull up any article, random article. Me, personally, I like planes. I like articles about planes. I find them fascinating. But it could be a taper. It could be a triceratops. It could be Pokemon character. Any article. There's a random article button. I encourage you to try it. And remember that somebody built this for you. Somebody out there that you've never met and probably never will 
built this for you. They did it because they love you. They did it because they believe that humanity can be a better version of itself. The mere fact of Wikipedia's existence gives hope to me for us all. Thank you. I think it, is it a better seat? Apparently more of the audience can see you from oh, that hi. seat. <laughs> Do you mind if I take a glass of water? You may have noticed, I apologize, I'm losing my voice. Um, thank you, Catherine. That was, um, all right, so that was, I'll just see how long we've got. That was, uh, yeah, it was really inspiring to hear you talk about Wikipedia, both in terms of its kind of history and its um, scale and reach and the significance it plays, I think, on a, on, in, a, in, a, in a global fashion and, and the dedication which you clearly hold um, and many others in terms of contributing to this, to, to just an encyclopedia um, that's sort of embodied in those values um, that you spoke about, um, both the explicit ones around neutrality and transparency, but also the implicit ones around um, inclusivity. Uh, yeah, so it was very inspiring, and I think really appropriate to have it at this place at this time. Um, I guess, I try not to be cynical, the, the, the cynical person here. The question for me, I think, and perhaps I want to raise a couple of questions before throwing it open to the audience to either pick up on what I'm my, you know, this conversation or the, um, the keynote in general was, you know, um, thinking about those values and that vision, this, the, the sum of all human knowledge, but how that kind of plays out um, in an increasingly diverse and complex um, digital environment in which um, it's not just Wikipedians and what Wikipedia does and stands for and its history um, and, the, and its vision but the kind of political and social context in which um, it finds itself, in which it operates. Uh, and so I guess I wanted to touch on perhaps three themes in our discussion. One, thinking about access and equity. One, about openness and transparency. And the other, about um, knowledge and truth. Um, so as we've heard a couple of mentions already, um, that President um, Erdogan in Turkey has in the last 24 hours, and as far as I know, still blocked, is it still blocked, uh, Wikipedia? Since I went on, came into the room and lost my internet signal. Right, yeah, okay. I, I believe so. Um, yeah, so which raises questions around, despite the kind of principles um, and, um, you know, vision of, of Wikipedia, that questions of access, which, you know, it has historical you know, issues around questions of access, around the digital divide, um, around bandwidth, um, around having the kind of knowledge to, or the capacity, I should say, to, you know, be able to contribute. And I think you flagged that with thinking about sort of white male technologists, you know, um, you know dominating the content of Wikipedia historically. And so the, I, I think historically we could see it in terms of those traditional kinds of questions of access um, and privilege, mm -hmm. um, but I guess the question is what the current climate that Wikipedia now faces in terms of thinking about you know, sort of global politics. And so what Wikipedia's and Wikimedia's response is to, um, to the question of, of like the Turkish situation now and you know, the potential for that to be, to, 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 for external forces of power to exert that power onto Wikipedia um, and yeah, what Wikipedia's <laughs> response is to that, that climate. <clears throat> so how is Wikipedia navigating global geopolitics? Uh, yes, that's yes, a light, thank you. Light, no, no worries, it's a light question and, and structural privilege and power. Um, you know, imperfectly, as I, as I suggested earlier, we are imperfect, we are, I think the wonderful thing about Wikipedians that I truly love is that I've never met a group of people who enjoy being told more that they're wrong 
because it gives them something to go fix, uh, which is something that is a truly Wikipedian characteristic. And so on some of those issues of um, balance and representation, I think that uh, highlighting and identifying them are the first step. When it comes to some of the other issues that you've brought up around how do we face a world today that seems increasingly unstable and difficult to predict, you know, these are issues that aren't just faced by Wikipedia. These are issues of society as a whole. I look at the internet today and I go, yes, it's far more fragmented than it has been before. It's subject to national control in different ways, censorship, absolutely. Not just censorship, commercial pressures that have made it uh, incredibly centralized, that have led to a decrease in privacy and agency over the information that we're sharing. These are real challenges and they are very different than the world upon, in which Wikipedia came about. You know, we've taken our own personal stand on some of these issues by saying, for example, we're not gonna track your data. We don't want to know what it is you're looking at. We believe that freedom of inquiry thrives in privacy. That's actually really a sen Yeah, I'll let, I'll let applause for that. <laughs> We believe that that's really essential. And we've also made some trade-offs by saying, we're gonna provide really strong encryption in order to protect that freedom of inquiry. We have the strongest encryption possible on our websites right now, which also means that if a government chooses to wants to selectively block a page because they disagree with it, they have to make the choice about whether they're gonna block all of Wikipedia or none of Wikipedia. Um, that's a choice that we've made. It's a choice that we stand by. We believe that that is actually the commitment that we have to our readers is to protect their privacy, is to believe, to act in the best interest of the public and the best interest of knowledge. It's a scary thing to do, but it's a privilege that we have in some ways because we're not in it for the market value. We're not in it for the capitalization. We're not in it to sell your data. So we don't have and face the same pressures around we've got to keep this market open. We can actually make the choice to say knowledge is valuable. Knowledge should not be censored. The right to information is a fundamental right. Now, in the specific case of, of what's happening in Turkey, you know, um, it's an ongoing conversation. Uh, it wasn't actually... Uh, um, the Prime Minister who blocked it, it was a regulatory agency, um, and we are awaiting more information from them on what that issue is. Uh, as we publish today on our blog, we are going to be pursuing um, further conversations both with them, but also trying to understand what, <coughs> excuse me, recourse exists within the Turkish judicial system. <coughs> I'm so sorry. Um, <coughs> excuse me one second. <coughs> I've spent a long time talking about Turkey the last 24 hours. Um, <coughs> and, you know, we're certainly going to be looking into what those, those questions um, and to what we can do there because we want to restore access to Wikipedia for the Turkish people. It's very popular in Turkey. It's written, as you can imagine, Turkish Wikipedia is written primarily for Turks, uh, by Turks for Turks. And so we know that it's something that has a lot of value. Uh, you know, this, this is a, it's a real issue today that information, <clears throat> perhaps more than any time, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry, <clears throat> more than any time in my lifetime, has returned to the realm of sort of state power and commercial control. And we find that, of course, frightening to some extent, but we also find it empowering because we believe that our mission is more important than ever. And we find that it has redoubled the commitment of the communities that we work with, the partners that we have, and the institutions that we ally with around ensuring that this knowledge is freely available in perpetuity, no matter where you are in the world, so that even if you might be blocked in Turkey, we're not going to turn it off for you. We're not going to selectively censor it's going to be there when you come back to the grid and can come back to being part of the knowledge ecosystem. Thank you, yes. <laughs> um, and yeah, I think in hearing you talk just now, I mean, it's, um, you, you know, and, and hearing you talk in, the, uh, in, your, in your keynote around um, generosity, in many ways, I mean, Wikipedia feels like a kind of a legacy from an older kind of web. I mean, you mentioned it in your talk. You yeah. said we're from the old web. You know, yeah, we're, we're from the, the cool web. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you know, before Everyone the web, the dial-up song, right? Yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Before it's a kind of increasingly kind of closed down and commercialized, and as you just talked about there, you know, the, in which users are kind of contributing value through through their data as a resource to be mined, as opposed to a kind of a, a resource for kind of uh, for knowledge, for sharing of knowledge, and that generosity that you talked about. And so maybe flipping it a little, then I think um, 
perhaps not so much less politics <laughs> and thinking perhaps about another problem on the internet, which is, you know, and I think we've all been there, you know, that, that sort of Wikipedia click hole where we begin, um, you know, looking at something and we follow so many links until we get to a point where we can't remember how we got there and where we started and even why we started. We love that. Um, and so there's this tension, I think, between, you know, the openness that you spoke to and, you know, how great that is in terms of, you know, the contemporary political climate. But there's something else about the kind of openness um, and the tension between, on the one hand, this, you know, democratic participation and, and knowledge, um, you know, of, of the sort of crowdsourced and open Wikipedia with the tension of something that's being faced, another kind of problem arising on the internet, which is sort of information abundance and overload, mm. the kind of subjective sort of, you know, inability to kind of cope with or manage um, so much information. And so that tension between, on the one hand, openness and, you know, you, know, you can trace the history of any edits on any Wikipedia page uh, with, um, you know, how that works in contributing to the problem that's been identified of sort of information abundance and overload. So I think the clearest example of us of this for us is Pokemon. Um, at one point, every Pokemon character had its own article. Mm -hmm. We decided that was information abundance. <laughs> <laughs> that is no longer the case. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm joking, of course. No, I'm not actually joking. That is a real story. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, there's a, there's a tension actually. Did you delete, were, pay, were Pokemon character pages deleted? Oh, I mean, I didn't delete them. The fact, to be clear, the Wikimedia Foundation does not delete content I on said, Wikipedia. Well, I, didn't know you, I said, were they? Yeah, uh, yeah. They were consolidated, right. which is what happens when, when information runs amok on Wikipedia. Um, some other editor, some industrious editor, will come along and provide some structure and order to it. Um, you know, I don't actually worry too much about information abundance on Wikipedia. I fall into the camp of being an inclusionist and an eventualist. <laughs> uh, because we do have different sort of religions on Wikipedia. You've got people who believe um, that there are certain things that belong in an encyclopedia and there are other, for other things that are less encyclopedic. I have respect for that. It's just not where my head's at. I think that more things belong in and I also believe that I'm an eventualist in the sense that you can leave a bad article up that'll eventually be improved. Um, because we aren't limited by some of the same constraints. And I think that you know these questions about what constraints of the bookshelf or constraints of editorial um, oversight or printing costs, for example. But, you know, I think that some of these questions about what is information abundance and what is information overload is also, there are also questions of gatekeeping and who then determines what is good information and what is bad information and what is notable information. And I think that you have to really rigorously engage with the question of who's the gatekeeper in that instance. Um, the thing that I think makes Wikipedia a little bit different is that, yes, you could have an article on every single topic conceivable under the sun, but it still has to adhere to those principles that I mentioned earlier. It still has to have minimum standards of notability. It still has to be cited back to secondary sources. It still has to be written in a neutral way. And there can only be one version of it. That is a luxury that most places, I'm sorry, most places have the luxury of not having to conform to that. So if you log into a social site, for example, you'll get a feed which is full of information. If you log into Wikipedia, or you don't have to log into Wikipedia, but if you come to Wikipedia, there's just one version of an article because we actually have to go through the process of determining what's good information and what's bad information and how do we make sense of it and how do we present a coherent whole to the world as opposed to perhaps a place where you're basically looking at a raw, unedited id of your social network. I think that that information overload can be tremendously overwhelming. It can be overwhelming because there's no sen a sense of why information's being presented to you, where it's coming from, how it's been shared, you know, the quality and veracity and verifiability of it. Whereas every single, single thing that goes onto Wikipedia ultimately has to survive the scrutiny of the public and has to make sense within the article context itself. I think that that actually is quite valuable. It gives us a framework for understanding information and perhaps reduces that sort of cognitive overload. Thanks. Um, well, I'm uh, speaking of... Cognitive overload. <laughs> I'm cognizant of time. Uh, so I'll just ask one more question before throwing it open to the audience, uh, which I guess is picked up on that question. Sorry, of... I speak in paragraphs. I'm a Wikipedian. <laughs> well, that's it. I mean, you know, it, it, you, you're entrained by the platform. You have to kind of write in a certain kind of way, right? When you're editing, you're stylistically. And... So it's not just about verifiability. There is... 
Anyway, that's a separate conversation okay. about <laughs> biases. But anyway, uh, it's one about social media and gatekeeping and I think the organisation of knowledge and something that's kind of you know, prevalent in, in discourse, contemporary discourse around um, social media platforms is the kind of algorithmic shaping of the information and the content that we get. So clearly this is kind of prominent in the news. It's part of the story of fake news. Um, it's... Um, you know, the role of not just, you know, humans in creating and sharing knowledge, but the role of kind of machinic processes in there as well. It's something that's kind of, you know, been discussed in other contexts, but little, and I guess, I mean, you know, so it doesn't really get a lot of coverage in the context of Wikipedia. And I wonder if you could talk to a little bit where, where you see the role of automation. And, it's, you know, given this context in Melbourne Knowledge Week, automation is something that's getting a lot of coverage in terms of, the future of cities, the future of work. And so automation in the context of how knowledge is being curated, particularly given that um, there's, you know, recently there's been from the Oxford Internet, in, uh, Internet Institute this year, I noticed there was a, a publication that was talking about the kind of bat battle of bots on, on, um, on Wikipedia, re revising and re-revising in this kind of back and forth battle each other's. Uh, <laughs> article, uh, edits, based on the kind of what they'd been programmed to do and then this kind of back and forth. And so I guess it's a broader question around, you know, the, cu the automation and automated curation of knowledge, where you think that fits in in the context of, of Wikipedia, but how perhaps it, it, it differs to the, the broader contexts of um, or the automation of knowledge, particularly through sort of algorithmic organisation of, of our feeds and information. Yeah, um, the study that you're referring to, I, I love it. It's like the great bot wars of 2016. Um, so Wikipedia actually already uses quite a lot of automation because we are such a huge sprawling resource. As I mentioned, 40 million articles. There's kind of no way that you can keep track of all of that without some degree of automation. And that's mostly bots, as you were referencing, that are written primarily by Wikipedians themselves, volunteers who use them to track things that are happening on the sites. And sometimes this is really helpful and they mostly perform pretty low level tasks, like checking articles to make sure they've got citations, um, reverting vandalism where we see it, there's some pretty notable patterns of vandalism, uh, particularly during the school day. Uh, <laughs> that, you know, we don't need to have editors spending a lot of their time checking and reverting. Those are, bots are great for that. And the philosophy that we've historically taken around this is like, let the bots do what humans can do, but let's, you know, let humans focus on the higher value tasks. And I think that that's really the focus that we take in terms when it comes to thinking about machine learning and artificial intelligence, is how can it augment the work that Wikipedians are already doing so that they can focus on really critical, complex information, um, gathering and curating and, and sort of creation. Um, one thing that I think is really different about the way that we work is that everything's in the public. All of the data that we have, all of the research that's done, it's all done with explicit public consent. It's all done in public notice boards. The data itself is all open. The data we train the algorithms are on are all open. Uh, once the algorithms are out there, we release it all to the public and other researchers so they can identify bias within them. And we actually think that this is the ethical way to do this sort of software development, uh, because we know that there are problems inherent in the system, right? To quote Monty Python. Uh, we know that there are, <laughs> are, are biases inherent in the system. And so we ourselves are biased as individuals. We're based in San Francisco. We write software for an encyclopedia that's read by literate people, primarily from you know, wealthy parts of the world. But if we make it open, at least we're acknowledging what those biases are. You know, I'm not totally sure what information creation is going to look like in you know, 10 years from now, I look with great curiosity at things like neural networks. I wonder if at some point it's going to be possible to toss a bunch of magazine references and newspaper references into that and all of a sudden have a Wikipedia article. I don't think it's gonna be as good. I don't think it's gonna be as funny. I don't think it's gonna be as weird. I don't think it's gonna be as human. I think it's gonna lose a lot of the things that make us love places like Wikipedia, but it's certainly going to be possible, I think. So if that's the case, what, yet is the value for, Wiki for Wikipedians or humans in general to offer. And I would posit that it's actually that, it's humanity. And so, okay, fine, let's let the machines write the articles, but let's be really rigorous about the way that we're training them and, um, and, 
and reprimanding them, right? <laughs> like, let's be, let's get that rolled up newspaper and keep them off the couch. Like, that feels really important to me. Um, if we're going to have a world in which machines are part of the conversation that we're in, let's make sure that we're having a really healthy, open dialogue about what that actually looks like. You know, we don't take the step of putting AI or M machine learning on any of the things that we do without explicit consent. And I think that that is actually, everybody should be informed. Explicit consent should be part of the narrative we have around technology. Thank you. Um, yes, thanks. <laughs> so I think we've got some roving mics. Yes, and we've already got hands popping up. So I'll throw it open to... Um, I've got two back here. Maybe we could start with those. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you for the presentation, and I actually agree, I'm an ethicist, I agree with your statement that everyone wants to do good, unfortunately everyone has a different idea of what is good, <laughs> um, case in point, Gator, uh, Gamergate, uh, the Wikipedia page for that is, still is a war zone even a couple of years later, um, problem there being is that Gamergate itself was very hard to verify in the sense that the event itself was never objective to start with, mm -hmm. so it was current, it was highly contentious, highly political, and therefore extremely hard to verify anything about it. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, the peer review system you have going is an excellent concept, but it's only as good as the peers. So how do you manage that? I mean, things like brigading, things like doxing, things like um, bot networks, and so on and so forth. And if you do actively intervene in these cases, how do you prevent your own biases and agendas from bleeding in? Yeah, that is, wow, that's a really great question. Uh, that's more of a, like a thesis answer than a paragraph. Um, so I was there for, I was at the foundation when, when this was happening with the Gamergate article, and it was a time of really high stress, uh, but certainly not just for people who work at the Wikimedia Foundation, for a lot of our editors. Um, people got really, they were burnt out by it. It was not good. Um, we have this expression, assume good faith, and we talk about good faith edits and bad faith edits, basically trying to loosely differentiate, as you said, people want to do good, what, what, but what is good? Um, and a lot of our good faith editors tried to step in and like separate people and like let cooler heads prevail and ended up dragged into some pretty nasty situations. And so one of the things that we've been focusing on actually within the foundation is we have a new initiative to focus on um, harassment and sock puppeting um, and are working with our community to understand what do these patterns look like? You know, what are the big challenges that editors face and what would be solutions that would actually empower people to address them, both human and technological solutions, but also escalations from a governance perspective. Uh, what policies exist that are not adequately that don't adequately cover some of these challenges and how might we address those too. Uh, one thing that we've just rolled out, for example, is a uh, legal fund for defense of people who are harassed on Wikipedia. It doesn't happen a lot. We're not like other places on the web. We do have some really nice policies around civility, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't happen once you step off Wikipedia. Um, and so we've rolled out a, a fund that's administrated by our legal team that actually allows people, if they've experienced this and have had you know, threats of severe harm, to be able to come to us and we can actually provide some resources for, for um, the fallout from that. So we're, we're really looking at what's the comprehensive way that we address this. We do believe that a culture, uh, a welcoming culture, um, is actually critical to some of the challenges that I mentioned earlier about inclusivity. Um, we think that starting with community health is probably the first way to go and really listening to the problem that editors have today. They're not going to be all technical solutions. We can't solve the rest of the internet, these are challenges. These are societal challenges, not just our own challenges. But we're hoping by engaging this in an open way and then publishing everything that we're going through, the good, the bad, the ugly, the research, the data, um, it can perhaps be a corpus that's of value to other institutions as well and that we can learn from dialogue around what's working and what's not. Um, I think there was another one, just a couple down. Yes. Oh. And then we'll go into the middle because this hand was up first. Ah, uh, yes, very early. Thank you. No, no, you, yes, you, okay. I'm going to go for it. Um, only because I'm, I'm really excited. I was so blown away by your presentation. Um, thanks a lot. Um, the question I have, because I'm, I'm a social entrepreneur myself and I've been developing a technology for some time, uh, when it comes to funding and sustainability, um, I'd just love to get a little bit of an insight uh, from you on how you guys are doing in that space. We are incredibly fortunate 
and we count our blessings every day. Uh, the same thing that makes Wikipedia possible uh, in terms of the millions of people who contribute to Wikipedia and have built it over time from a content perspective is the same thing that makes Wikipedia sustainable. Uh, in the last fundraising season, we had 5.4 million people contribute to Wikipedia from all over the planet. And the, I know it's a big number. And the average donation was about 14 US dollars, but that started with one dollar, right? The kid who puts aside their lunch money to make it possible to be able to come to Wikipedia and give give something to us. Um, and we value every single one of those dollars. I should be really clear. It's part of our independence. It's part of what makes us possible. It's part of what makes us beholden only to knowledge and only to you and only to the public. Um, and that's about 90% of, that makes up about 90% of our budget. And then the remaining 10% is sort of larger foundations uh, that are focused on specific initiatives. For example, that anti-harassment work I was just speaking about earlier. I think that that's very unusual for an organization. Um, it's, yeah, I know. <laughs> um, it's very unusual. It, it happens and it works for us because of the scale that we're at. Uh, but we certainly don't take it for granted. We're very much aware that the internet is changing every single day. Browser behavior is changing. The way people access us is changing. You know, if you have a connected home device and you ask it a question, um, you're not necessarily learning that much of that information actually comes from Wikipedia. And you're certainly not engaged with an opportunity to think about how to, from our perspective, what's most important, contribute to Wikipedia and change it if there's a problem, or build on it and, and make it better, um, but also not uh, necessarily prepared or positioned to be able to contribute back. And so we're aware of this, and, and we're trying to figure out what that future looks like. Um, but we recognize how fortunate we are. I think that the thing that I would give advice, recommend, or perhaps if I could provide some, not advice, but learning, is that people contribute to Wikipedia because they get value out of it. You know, we can, I can sit here in front of you and talk about the values and how important it is and how we educate the world and how it's changed people's lives. And all of this is true. But time and time again, when we survey people about why they give, they be, give because they like it. They give because it solved a bar bet. They give because they got in it. I'm, I'm not kidding. Like, I, one of my favorite quotes is like, I got in this debate with my girlfriend and, you know, I went on Wikipedia and I was right. So here's five bucks, you know. <laughs> Uh, they give because it has a tangible, um, there's a tangible value in their lives. And so as a social entrepreneur, I would say, what's the service that you're providing? And how do you ask people to value that service? And, you know, then scale accordingly. Um, we might just take one final question. I'm sorry to oh, let Catherine too. rest her voice at you. <laughs> this um, from the person who's been very patiently waiting. Thank you. Yeah, just um, just two questions. Um, well, just two. Uh, no, no, no. Sorry. Two two requests for facts. Two requests for facts, essentially. So, what are the most conflicted topics on Wikipedia? Which 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 are, you know which where are the wars in in um, in web pages? And what 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 how many countries uh, is Wikipedia blocked from? And what proportion of global citizenry would that? Con I assume there's maybe a small number of countries, but it might be a large proportion of the sure. global population. So the first question was, where are the edit wars? Um, and there are Wikipedians in the audience, so I will tread carefully on this. Um, you know, the classic edit wars are about politicians, they're about border disputes, um, but, my fi but they're not always like that high stakes, right? They're not always in the realm of geopolitics and the Security Council. Um, my favorite edit war was a multi-thousand word description on English Wikipedia about what photo should be used to illustrate Paris. <laughs> Should it be a picture of the city center, city center with all of its you know, lovely sort of 16th, 17th, 18th century architecture? Or should it be a picture of the skyline with uh, La Défense in the background, right? The skyscrapers. Is, city, is the city of Paris a museum city or a modern city? No joke. Thousands of words went on for months. I got a call from the Figaro asking me, like, how is this ever going to be educated? So Wikipedians can, can really engage in the meat of every conversation, and you never know what's going to be a hot zone. That would be my first answer. Um, on the, the second point, where are we blocked? I mean, at the moment, I don't believe you can access Wikipedia uh, in China on Chinese Wikipedia um, and Turkish Wikipedia, of course, at the moment in Turkey. Um, it is possible that there are other places where there are outages uh, or were not accessible. I would point to perhaps North Korea, but there's so little access to the internet there or somewhere like Eritrea that we just don't know. Um, it's hard to evaluate what we, what we can't measure. So in terms of the world's population, those are 
Turkey certainly is a relatively large country. Uh, China is obviously a very large country. Um, you know, we know that that's not available, and yet we're optimists. You know, people edit Wikipedia in Chinese from all over the world. Um, in fact, it's really interesting because a lot of people with a lot of different perspectives edit Wikipedia in Chinese. Um, that's pretty cool. Uh, but we're optimistic that keeping Wikipedia uh, growing and alive and thriving means that when we do finally have the opportunity to meet our new generation of Chinese Wikipedians, we're going to be there ready to welcome them. Thank you.